Hello, in this presentation, we'll introduce general principles of fire protection, define material categories and construction classifications for structures, and discuss the approaches that are used to determine the required fire ratings for structural elements. We'll conclude with a discussion of the temperature effects on steel and different approaches for providing fire protection for structural steel. I should say up front that I'm not an expert in this area, but we really don't need to be experts to appreciate the importance of fire protection, and a little bit of knowledge will go a long way to understand how fire protection drives certain aspects of the design of our structures. Let's get started. I'll start off this presentation by asking a question. What event most directly led to the development of building codes in the United States and around the globe? The answer, of course, is the great fires that swept through the United States in the 19th century. Between 1838 and 1871, there were five great fires in Charleston, New York City, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, and Chicago. The Chicago fire was by far the most devastating, and it was this event that most directly led to the development of building codes. At the time, Chicago was the fifth largest city in the U.S. The prevailing theory is that the fire started when a cow knocked over a kerosene lamp in a barn, but another theory suggests that this was just an alibi for a group of drunk men that were gambling when they actually knocked the lamp over themselves. The fire burned for roughly 24 hours and stopped only because it started to rain and because the fire ran out of fuel. Those of you familiar with Chicago know that the downtown area is bounded on the east side by Lake Michigan and is bounded on the west side by the Chicago River. When the fire reached these natural boundaries, it ran out of fuel and then the rain put it out. The fire destroyed approximately 2,000 acres or one third of the city. 17,000 buildings were destroyed, 300 people were killed, and 100,000 people were left homeless. It was a massive catastrophe. The financial losses were staggering and insurance companies were left on the hook for much of that. $222 million in property damage at that time correlates to approximately $5.4 billion in today's dollars when adjusted for inflation. This photo shows what the city looked like after the fire was extinguished. The photo on the bottom shows a panoramic view of the city, and the photo on the top is actually a zoomed-in portion of the other photo showing the devastation. I think that the photo shown here is just a retouched version of the photo that was shown on the previous slide, but it does a really good job of showing the amount of destruction that occurred because of this fire. Once the fire started and got out of control, it led to the complete destruction of the downtown area. The only thing that remained after the fire were some portions of masonry buildings and some structures that were spared almost miraculously. One of the things that makes this fire truly remarkable, however, is that the same thing happened again three years later in 1874 in what is known as the Little Chicago Fire. This time the fire was much smaller in scope, but still destroyed 47 acres of the city, destroyed 812 buildings, and killed approximately 20 people. A year later, in 1875, Chicago adopted a formal building code and commissioned a Department of Buildings to administrate that code. This was the impetus for the first building codes in the United States. After the fire, the people of Chicago rebuilt the city to become the fourth largest city in the U.S. by 1880, and they did so by embracing steel construction. One of the earliest examples of steel construction was the Home Insurance Building. At 10 stories, it was a skyscraper of its time. This structure represents one of the first examples of skeletonized construction where an internal frame supports the floors and the exterior walls or the envelope of the structure. The guiding principle of fire design is that once a fire starts, the goal is to keep that fire from spreading. We want to keep it from spreading from one room to another, from one floor to another, and from one building to another. To accomplish this, we embrace the idea of compartmentalization. Think of fire doors that automatically close when a fire alarm goes off. Those doors keep the fire from spreading and deprive the fire of oxygen. After that, our goal is to suppress the fire using active fire protection, or at least slow the spread of the fire using fat passive fire protection. Active fire protection is, as the name implies, something that is done proactively to try and either suppress the fire or extinguish it entirely. Usually when we talk about fire protection, we're talking about a sprinkler system in the building. In some cases, however, think of a server farm for Google or a storage room for the National Archives, 
The active fire protection system might be something more sophisticated like a halon system. In other cases, an active system might include self-pressurizing stairwells, allowing firefighters to more easily access and extinguish the fire. The alternative to active fire resistance is passive resistance. Passive systems are designed to slow down or retard the spread of the fire or extend the durability of the structural system until the fire can be extinguished, presumably by firefighters. The time that it takes to extinguish the fire can be anywhere from 30 minutes to several hours. The amount of time that the structure has to survive before the fire is extinguished is referred to as the fire resistance rating. Typical passive resistance includes fire resistant coatings such as spray on fire protection. Buildings are generally categorized based on whether they're constructed from combustible or non-combustible materials. The Uniform Building Code in 1997 defined a non-combustible material as one which no part will ignite or burn when subjected to fire. There is a more specific test in the International Building Code, Section 703.5, that references an ASTM standard, but we don't need to dig into that level of detail for this presentation. One of our next steps is to define several different types of construction based on material that is used during construction. Buildings that are constructed from non-combustible materials generally qualify as Type 1 and Type 2 construction. Non-combustible materials are generally steel, concrete, and masonry type construction. Combustible materials, on the other hand, are basically any materials that don't meet the definition of a non-combustible material. Most often, this is wood. Structures that are constructed from both combustible and non-combustible materials are categorized as types 3, 4, or 5. Active and passive fire protection strategies are used to increase the fire resistance rating of these types of construction. The International Building Code includes five major types of construction, types 1 through 5, with type 1 being the most resistant to fire and type 5 being the least resistant to fire. Each of these five main types is further subdivided into an A or B classification, except that type four is subdivided into an A, B, C, or HT classification, resulting in 12 classes of construction with respect to fire resistance. Construction types one and two are basically constructed of non-combustible materials with the exception of some treated or fire retardant materials used in non-structural applications. Steel frame structures are generally either type 1 or type 2. Type 1 is sometimes referred to as fire resistant construction and type 2 is sometimes referred to as non-combustible construction. Type 3 construction is characterized by buildings with exterior walls made of non-combustible materials while the remaining portion of the structure are made up of any material permitted by the code. Type 4 construction is characterized by buildings where the exterior walls are again made of non-combustible materials and the interior building elements are either lumber, laminated wood, or timber. In Type 5 construction, the structural elements, exterior walls, and interior walls are made of any material permitted by the code. Table 504.3 of the International Building Code provides the maximum height of buildings based on the occupancy classification and the type of construction used. In this table, NS means not sprinklered, S means sprinklered, and UL means unlimited. The height of the structure is important in this context because as the height of the structure increases, it takes longer for the occupants of the building to evacuate and it becomes more challenging for firefighters to extinguish the fire. As a result, what you will tend to see in this table is that buildings that are more flammable or buildings that aren't required to have sprinkler systems are generally restricted to lower heights than buildings that are constructed out of non-combustible materials or buildings that have active fire suppression systems. Generally, an architect or engineer will use this table by entering from the left with a known occupancy group for the structure. At that point, the architect or engineer can determine which type of construction is required for a required building height or they can determine the height limitation based on a construction type that has been decided upon already. I've included this slide as a reminder as to which types of occupancy correspond with which occupancy groups. For example, group E is educational, group R is residential, group S is storage, etc., etc.
Construction type 1A provides the highest level of fire resistance, and as a result, the height of these structures is generally unlimited. But buildings in this class also require passive fire protection on all elements of the structure. Type 1B is similar to type 1A, but less fire protection is permitted, resulting in a one hour reduction in the fire resistance rating for most of the structural elements and a half hour reduction for the roof. Type 2A construction requires active or passive protection for all elements of the structure, whereas Type 2B construction does not require for fire protection for the structural elements. One of the key takeaways from this presentation is that steel construction generally falls into one of these four classifications. And as you move from Type 1A to Type 2B, the requirements for fire resistance are reduced, but the susceptibility to fire is increased. Thus, if you look at the IBC Table 504.3, you'll see that as you move from Type 1A to Type 2B, the height restrictions on the structure become more significant. Type 3 buildings are constructed from a mix of non-combustible and combustible elements, having non-combustible exterior walls and combustible interior construction. These building types arose in the U.S. at the end of the 19th century to combat the devastating fires that struck congested business districts such as Chicago. The buildings were designed to prevent a fire from spreading from building to building by requiring non-combustible exterior walls for the buildings. Tilt-up construction with concrete exterior walls and a wood frame floor supported by steel posts is a modern example of Type 3 construction. Type 4 construction is similar to Type 3 construction, with the exception that the entire interior of the structure is constructed of lumber or timber. Type 4A buildings have structural elements that are completely protected with non-combustible protection. Type 4B buildings have structural elements mostly protected with non-combustible protection. And Type 4C buildings have most structural elements left unprotected. The HT designates heavy timber construction, which is unique because the timbers or glue laminated members tend to develop a layer of char under fire that insulates the core of the members and protects it and increases its resistance to fire. Type 5 construction includes typical wood frame structures and is the only construction category that permits exterior walls and main structural members to be constructed of combustible materials. Typical wood framed homes would be considered type 5 construction. The distinction between type 5A and type 5B is that major elements in type 5A construction are required to have a 7 hour fire rating. This table from the Ching and Winkle text provides a nice summary of the different classifications of construction. As you move from left to right or from top to bottom, the fire resistance of the structure decreases. As a result, as you move from left to right or from top to bottom, the restrictions on the height of the structure become more severe. Table 601 from the International Building Code presents the fire resistance rating requirements for elements in a building. Once the type of building is known, this table can be used to determine the fire rating that's required for each of the elements in that building. So here are a couple of key definitions to take away from this presentation. A building element is defined as a fundamental component of building construction, which may or may not be a fire resistance rated construction and is constructed of materials based on the building type of construction. Sounds rather circular, but anyways, a fire resistance rating is defined as the period of time a building element, component, or assembly maintains the ability to confine the fire, continues to perform a given structural function, or both, and this is defined in the International Building Code Section 703. The time rating in hours indicates how long a building material, element, or assembly can maintain its structural integrity and heat resistance in a fire and corresponds to the type of construction. The chart on this slide illustrates the influence of temperature on coup test results of steel. The data comes from a report on the World Trade Center collapse and is presented in Celsius, so I have the conversion shown here as well for those of us more familiar with the Fahrenheit scale. For temperatures up to about 300 degrees Celsius, there isn't a whole lot of difference in the behavior of a steel coupon relative to one that's tested at room temperature. 
One thing that you can see, however, is that the well-defined yield point and the yield plateau on the stress strain response are lost at a relatively modest temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. But there's not much change in the tensile strength and there isn't much change in stiffness, at least at service stress levels. If the temperature is increased a bit further, however, you can start to see significant losses in strength and stiffness at 400 degrees Celsius and beyond. And beyond. The loss in strength has obvious effects on the performance of the structure, but the loss in stiffness can be as detrimental or even more so than the loss of strength since the buckling strength is a function of the modulus of elasticity. The chart on this slide shows the ISO 834 standard temperature time curve that is used as a standard for analysis of compartmentalized fires. There are numerous factors that influence a given fire, such as the type of fuel, the size of the room, the height of the ceiling, the availability of oxygen, etc., etc. But as you can see, the standardized curve shows that the temperature in a fire maxes out at around 1000 degrees Celsius after approximately 90 minutes. But what is more remarkable is that it only takes a few minutes for the temperature to reach 400 or 600 degrees Celsius, the temperature where the properties of the steel start to degrade. Typically speaking, the goal is to provide protection for the structure, either active or passive, so that the temperature of the material doesn't get too hot before either the occupants can evacuate the building or the fire can be extinguished. The most common passive fire protection that is used with steel building structures is sprayed on fire protection or sprayed fire resistant materials. This is generally some type of a fibrous material that is sprayed onto the structure after it is erected, but before the HVAC, electrical, and plumbing work is started. The material acts as an insulator to delay the effects of heat on the steel during a fire. One of the primary benefits of sprayed on fire resistant materials is that they are typically easy to apply, though it can be messy and proper personal protection equipment is needed for those that are applying the material. The amount of fire resistance that is, that is achieved depends on the thickness of the material as it's applied, and one drawback to the use of the material is that it can be easily knocked off of the steel when the HVAC, electrical, and plumbing work is done after the fire protection is applied. An older method of providing fire protection for the steel is to simply encase the steel in concrete. This is a photo from under the press box at Nippert Stadium on the University of Cincinnati campus, and these battered columns are actually composite, constructed of steel wide flange shapes encased in reinforced concrete on the outside. This photo shows the same columns under construction, and you can see that the columns closest to us have reinforcing installed, but have not yet had the formwork installed. The next three columns have had the concrete cast and the formwork stripped, and the three beyond those still have the formwork in place. The remaining columns furthest from the front look like they're still waiting to have their reinforcing and formwork installed. Although less common now than it used to be, in certain cases it can be advantageous to use reinforced concrete as a protection for the steel. The biggest advantage for using concrete for fire protection is that it offers a lot of durability for the cost. However, one of the chief disadvantages is that it requires a bit more labor to install than sprayed on fire protection, and it adds quite a bit of dead load to the structure. Nippert Stadium is a good application for encased structural steel or composite steel concrete construction because the concrete protects the steel from the fire, and in this case where the columns are somewhat exposed can also protect the steel from damage should a vehicle happen to run into them. Another option for fire protection is intermescent coatings. These coatings are paint-like materials that are inert at low temperatures, but undergo a chemical reaction at temperatures around 400 to 500 degrees Fahrenheit to provide protection for the steel. Intermescent coatings can be a bit more expensive than other options and are often reserved for laboratory or industrial applications where sprayed on fire protection is not effective or not practical. These coatings are typically divided into one of two families, the first being thin film solvent based or water based coatings that are used typically in buildings, and the second being thick film coatings that were developed for the offshore oil industry. Other methods of passive fire protection for steel structures include fire boards that look like drywall but are actually fire retardant, fire blankets, or cement block. 
Using these methods, the structural elements are wrapped in the fire resistant materials to increase their fire rating. If you want to learn more about fire resistance of steel structures, I suggest that you take a look at Design Guide 19 from AISC. If you're a student, you can enroll for a free student membership to AISC, and then you'll be able to download many of their design guides and other resources at no cost. If you aren't a student, then you can pay for membership to get their design guides at no cost, or you can simply pay for the design guide. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Thanks a lot for watching.